Back in my King of the Ants review, I mentioned that I wasn't working with a complete filmography of the Asylum. The main list I was working with, one from Wikipedia and one on the Asylum's official site, both contained different titles and different release dates, with some movies being on one, but not the other. And if it wasn't hard enough trying to merge two lists into one fairly complete chronology of the Asylum's catalog, it turns out that there's a third list to work from. IMDB lists a crap ton of other titles that are in some way tied to the Asylum, as a distributor, producer, or both. Going over a couple of these movies, I thought they had to be distributed by some other company that just so happened to be known as the Asylum, especially since the dates for these predated their founding, but nope. Here's a movie from 1992, with the Asylum's stamp of approval on the back, technically making this the oldest movie connected to the Asylum. In fact, looking through the list, it turns out that the company distributed dozens of films outside of Belly Fruit and Foreplay, the only two that were listed on Wikipedia. Heck, if the IMDb list is to be believed, they apparently distributed 56 movies before Belly Fruit had its time to shine. And that's another problem. I don't know how much I can trust IMDb. It's basically the Wikipedia of casting credits. Anyone can go in and change or add facts in the hope some stupid internet critic will see that one movie was given an unofficial sequel title to another movie they featured and be fooled into featuring it on their show. Heck, it might have already fooled a lot of us, including me. My copies of Belly Fruit and Foreplay don't have the Asylum logo anywhere, so Wikipedia may also be a total liar, big shock, and my first two reviews of the Asylum have nothing to do with the Asylum. And if they're telling the truth about what the Asylum made or distributed, a lot of the listed titles are long out of print, with copies extremely expensive or straight up impossible to find, making my complete retrospective of the Asylum pretty much a failure on every front. So, for the sake of this retrospective, or whatever it's become after that revelation, we're going to take a few steps back and try to start over from the beginning. I'm not re-reviewing the movies I've already looked at, but I am going to try to talk about the titles I missed. And with the revelation of just how many titles bear the Asylum's name, I'm going to try to limit anything featured here to movies directly tied in with the Asylum, or people notably associated with the Asylum. Even then, I'll probably end up leaving out titles or reviewing films not even remotely connected to the Asylum, but as always, I'm working with what I can find. So, like everything else that's released nowadays, consider this a reboot slash remaster of Locked in the Asylum. The opener says the same, though. big help. Here, take him this. Can't go wrong with a banana. For such a prolific B-movie studio, there's surprisingly very little history on record about its founding or its initial executives. The only information readily available is that the company was founded in 1997 by David Michael Latt, Sherry Strain, and David Wimowai, none of which even have Wikipedia articles, on a site that has over 300 words on banana production in Iceland. Lat and Wimowai both still actively manage and create content for the Asylum, but, and I can't confirm this, Strain seems to have left, or at least gone inactive sometime after 2007, and now works with a bunch of other studios to produce horror films and sexual thrillers. Except for a brief reuniting in 2017 when the Asylum distributed Dreamhouse Nightmare, she also helped produce one of Griff first films, who has appeared several times in this retrospective and will likely meet again. And she was a producer for R. Kelly's Vanity Project, but we won't hold that against her. But before all this, Strain and Wimowai were executives at Village Roadshow, which manages film and entertainment in Australia, and Lat was doing... something, but apparently dreaming of becoming a director. There are no accounts about how Lat and Wimowai met, but they somehow found out about each other and they got to work on their first movie, with Wimowai producing and Lat directing. And what was that first movie that is technically the very first Asylum produced film, despite being released five years before its founding? Sorority House Party, aka Rock and Roll Fantasy, a sex comedy produced in 1992, but seemingly shelved until its release in 1994. Oh goody, I get to introduce the Asylum through a softcore skin flick yet again. Actually, with how many sex and exploitation movies the Asylum's produced, I should probably get used to it. And despite the IMDb list being the most complete out of all lists compiling Asylum movies, this is one of the movies not on there mostly because there was no Asylum credit yet. 
so I'm still reliant on the Asylum's official list to fill in the gaps, and to provide contradicting release dates. There's no existing backstory to this movie, and I think I've irrelevantly rambled on long enough, so let's check out the film that started it all. Alex is a college senior, and one of the few girls in her sorority who doesn't join in the frequent frat parties being held in and around her dorm. When she's not working on her final project for her degree in architecture, she fantasizes about a famous rock star named Jamie Z, and having a romantic night together in the impossible chance they ever met. But it looks like Jupiter has a line with Mars on the night of a blue moon solar eclipse as the rock star crashes his car nearby and, while incredibly intoxicated, ends up at the same bar Alex and her friend Bree are drinking at. Bree, always the prankster, takes Jamie and an equally intoxicated Alex back to the dorm and handcuffs Jamie to Alex's bed. In the morning, when both have sobered up and realize just what kind of situation they're in, Alex tries to get Jamie out, only to find that Bree has the key. Jamie screams for help, but only attracts the other sorority girls, all of which want him to plug in and turn on, and I don't mean his guitar. Eventually, somewhat of a romance blossoms between Jamie and Alex, until Jamie manages to escape the cuffs. However, he's soon back in Alex's life, and it all seems too good to be true. Mostly because it is. It turns out that the crash was orchestrated by Jamie's manager, who wants to make a dead legend out of Jamie. And when that failed to kill him, he enlists the help of a father-son hitman team to finish the job at all costs. Will Alex and Jamie escape the hit while their love for each other blossoms? Would all this be really creepy if the gender roles were switched? So saying the plot out loud, this sounds like the stupidest thing you've ever heard of in the last five minutes. And that's because it is. It is a stupid, stupid, STUPID movie. But it's supposed to be. It's one of those early college screwball comedies like Animal House or Revenge of the Nerds, a movie that pays tribute to while openly mocking college life. Obviously, it's not as funny or finance as those movies, but for its limitations, it's legitimately not bad. But I'm talking about a genre that includes King Frat, House Bunny, Neighbors, Monsters University, and in extremely goofy movies, so the bar wasn't set that high to begin with. The story is universally stock. I can't place where I've seen this setup before, but it just feels like it's always been around. There's a college, a celebrity ends up there, he or she hates it at first, but learns to love it and a romance blossoms, money suddenly becomes involved, people are sent to get the money or the thing that involves money, and it ends in a goofy chase through town where hijinks ensue. Also, there's a breakup somewhere, because every romance has to have a third act breakup, and the celebrity either finds they like normal life better, or their date becomes a celebrity as well. Even if you haven't seen any movies like this, you could idly write a similar script during a boring class period. But, as with most of the movies we've seen, the fun comes from their awareness of how stock they are, yet how much energy and humor they still inject into the film. It's a little over 90 minutes, with most of its runtime taken up with talking and long shots of partying, but there's never a dull moment. Everything is so quirky and even surreal, it legitimately feels like a fantasy. Some drugged up dream a 90s sorority girl had after a particularly tubular party. There's a long haired rock star handcuffed to a college girl's bed. There's a pair of comedic hitmen trying to kill him. He's tortured by a fundamentalist Christian girl who sings him folk protest songs. And what do you even say about a scene like this? Well, Rachel, God had his way, and I've got mine. And there comes a time where you just gotta kick some ass. And all of this is helped by the era this movie was made. It's a late 80s, early 90s comedy made at the peak of when movies didn't care about topping box office records or having a twist to end all twists. They were just entertaining movies for the sake of being entertaining movies. It's colorful, it's energetic, it's stuffed with the fashions and attitudes of the time. It's less focused on being original than being good at what it is. And what it is, is a hilariously dated adult comedy. This is the poster child for when political correctness wasn't an issue or if someone somewhere would be offended, so it unapologetically pulls out all the stops and throws in a good helping of the fads at the time. Rock musicians, comedic hitmen, casual drinking and smoking, wearing baseball caps whether you supported a team or not, a woman wanting to succeed in college and travel the world instead of becoming a rock star's play toy and somehow that's the wrong goal, it's all here. One of the hitmen is a gay, new age hippie who doesn't want to kill, he wants to mediate peaceful discussions. 
There's a long scene where one girl continually seduces and sexually teases a guy without his permission. Heck, the rock star is held hostage in a sorority where all the occupants ignore his cries of help and want to do him, and he develops Stockholm Syndrome towards Alex. In today's Me Too society, none of this would fly. At least unironically. And, in case you think they missed a trigger, let me introduce you to the best part of the movie, Jim, the Indian Indian. Oh, beautiful ladies. Could I introduce you to some curried hot spicy buffalo wings? Did anyone ever tell you you've got eyes like a llama at sunset? No, but my friend here could use a drink. Ah, uh, I shall get her a rug burn. So yeah, this movie is full of collar-tugging moments that would get the movie and everyone involved massacred by rabid Tumblrites I've seen today. But I can't get mad at it. Unlike an Adam Sandler or Spike Lee movie, which are intentionally made to push buttons, there's just such a naivete to this flick and how it's presented that it's clear they weren't trying to offend. That was just the social climate of the day, what was considered funny back then. And watching it all with that in mind, it's friggin' hilarious! This is a movie that hasn't aged well, but that just makes it more entertaining today than it probably was back then. Hey, do we are? Two mama mama New Delhi rug burns. Break up. And yet for how many other things you could get upset with about this movie, excessive sexual content isn't one of them. For a sex comedy, it's incredibly tame. Oh, we get a couple topless shots, but that's pretty much the extent of it. I don't even think they have sex in this movie. There's a scene where our leads look like they're having sex, but Alex's pants are still obviously on, so I don't know what they're doing. This is the least explicit Asylum movie I've seen. Foreplay is kinkier than this. But, as I said in that movie, I don't like most sexual humor, so hey, I'm fine with this. I think humor should come from the characters, and as with foreplay, that's what we get. A lot of these characters are surprisingly engaging and fun to watch. But most of that is, again, in how dated these characters are. Alex is the awkward college girl who just wants to focus on being smart and not on men, but this being a 90s movie is totally in the wrong for wanting that. She's the typical teenage young adult girl usually seen in movies from this era. The Disney princess who doesn't know that what she wants isn't what she needs, which is for Hot Prince Charming to enter her life and get her to throw away her future and run away with him. And I don't think I'm spoiling anything by saying that's what happens. Her project that would have equaled a degree in architecture and a grant to travel the world is destroyed and she just goes, Hey, I didn't want any of that stuff anyway. I got Def Leppard to fall over. Oh my god, it's so 90s. And of course, before she starts dating Mr. Big, her previous boyfriend is an uptight controlling fundamentalist who's somehow also the fraternity president despite being the biggest loser on campus. He probably put a lot of work into his studies and probably has a bright future ahead of him, but since Alex needs to hook up with Pretty Boy Floyd, he's the villain, going so far as to stage a panty raid on the sorority just so he can creep on Alex in the middle of the night. And he gets his ass handed to him by Queenside, which I could watch all day. I know who you are. You're that obnoxious rock star. Well, I think your music is puerile. <laughs> You can tell me what that means later. Jamie Z is your basic bland male romantic interest. Like I said, he's basically a Disney prince, someone good looking to fall in love with our lead and do whatever she says. But of course, he also has to be a bad boy and misunderstood, yet deep and malleable, all those cliches that women like in their romantic fantasies despite how much of a disaster an actual relationship with one of these men would be. Ooh, he used to perform at coffee houses where Alex once worked, and he's lost his way. He's a shell of who he once was, that sweet, innocent boy who sang from the heart but gave it all up to become famous. Will Alex somehow remind him of who he once was and convince him to feel again? Is the only interesting thing about him that he's played by a guy named Attila. Also, do you really want to date a guy who, despite driving his manager's car that conveniently had the brakes cut, never puts it together until the very end that his manager might want him dead? Kind of a red flag there. Speaking of, Jamie Z's manager and the hitmen he sends after Jamie serve as the comedic relief. And they're hilarious. 
The manager doesn't think Jamie's giving him the hits or respect he deserves, so he tries to make a legend out of Jamie by killing him and reaping the post-mortem benefits. So most of his screen time is him negotiating publicity and record deals to capitalize on Jamie's soon-to-be death. Yeah, he's already putting together a CD of Jamie just singing in the bathroom before Jamie's even dead. And look at him! Even though he's the villain, you want to laugh at him! With that jacket and mustache, he looks like Dan Aykroyd posing for the cover of a NASCAR game. I got the promo, and it's all wrong. It's not find Jamie Z, it's find Jamie Z's body. Well, it may be semantics to you, but I don't want to fill a million hysterical girls with false hope. Now get it right! I'll be right with you, Jamie. And another thing! Jamie! But he's not the only one trying an impression, as the father of the father-son hitman team is obviously doing his Ronnie Dangerfield. And coupled with a stereotypical mafioso accent, he's just as entertaining. Okay, I know, I know just the place. Indian Gyms. You can't miss it. It's got a big neon totem pole on top of the roof. 357 Magnum. Not only will it blow a good-sized hole in your target, but it's also good for bludgeoning. Just think, son. Someday, all this will be yours. What, the curtains? No, not the curtains, lad. And then you pair him with his son, who, like I said, is a gay New Age hippie who despises killing and just wants to talk things out. It's impossible not to laugh. If not at the dialogue, just at the absurdity of it all. Hey, look, it's a gopher! Dad! It was only just a, just a gopher? Just a gopher! Just a gopher! I'm sorry, but I just can't be around you right now. Namiranga! Namiranga! No respect at all. However, head and shoulders above everyone else is Bree. Bree is the party girl, the outgoing member of the sorority who tries to get Alex to open up while also having the time of her life. She's manipulative, she's mischievous, she's a tease, she's the one who gets Jamie and Alex in this situation to begin with. But she's having so much fun doing it that you can't hate her. She also has constantly wavering loyalty to Alex, from straight up tasering Jamie for making Alex feel bad, to straight up abandoning Alex just because she doesn't feel like it. She's the white woman equivalent of Chef from South Park. Every time she's on screen, she's the best part of the movie. And it helps that she's also given the best dialogue. Practically every line she says is out of context quotable. Well, I have trouble with aggression, but my psychologist says that's a common problem with nymphomaniac. Did I say nymphomaniac? I'm sorry, I'm a pathological liar. I'm always mixing those up. That's a good idea. What do you think he likes to eat? Well, let's think. He's a rock star. How about a bat's head and a cup of blood? Why don't you just admit it, Alex? You're addicted to model glue. You mean you don't remember table dancing for those Korean businessmen? Did I do that? No, but it would have been a lot easier to deal with in the morning. Do you want to fulfill my deepest fantasy? Then put on some dark clothes and wait for me in the middle of the street. Did you realize you burn the same amount of energy climbing a flight of stairs as you do having sex? That means I'm having the equivalent of four orgasms trying to get to geology every day. There are a couple other girls in this movie, and eh, they're fine. They're all stereotypes, but again, they're enjoyable stereotypes, and most of them get a chance to shine. Especially during the ending car chase, where the college slut and the college virgin, of course, end up in the same car chasing the hitman that kidnapped Jamie. How can you not love that concept alone? And once again, Jim the Indian Indian. Hello, dearest old friend. Time has passed slower than a yak since I've been seeing you. You look most unpleasant. Can I get you something? Whiskey. Bottle. There you go. The acting in this movie is... a mixed bag. The movie was a first for most of these actors, so you get a chance to see who has a natural talent and who probably should have skipped the casting call. We get some lively performances from most of the actors, especially Alex, Bree, the manager, and the hitman. Not necessarily good performances, but energetic enough to overlook their obvious inexperience. But then we get a few actors who... Alex, if you're thinking of turning this sorority house into a halfway house, you've got another thing coming. We don't need your GPA that bad. Yeah, great read there. The worst actor of the bunch is obviously Jamie Z. 
He was probably a model they hired just for his looks and not his acting experience. And it shows, as his entire performance can only be described as a hungover Bill and Ted. Apologize? Apologize for what? You and your friends are in serious trouble. Right now, my manager's on the phone to the cops, and there's gonna be thousands of them looking for me. And if I know Red, he's not gonna rest until I'm found! As this is a low-budget first movie, there's little to no star power to be seen. For most of the cast, this was their first and last movie, with maybe one or two minor appearances afterwards. While contrary, this was the final film for former child star April Lerman, who played Alex, and who most notably acted in Annie and the Scott Bayo show Charles in Charge. Attila did nothing else, Michael Xavier did nothing else, and most unfortunately J. Philip Gazal did nothing else. The biggest name in the cast is probably Alan Sharoff, who played Earl, the senior hitman. He's made a career of playing gangsters or army officials to this day, as well as playing Billy Crystal's dad in City Slickers 1 and 2, and Command & Conquer fans may recognize him as General Topolov from Red Alert Retaliation. And I am Russian. I do not like anybody. But I drink to you, comrade. Playboy model Avalon Anders, who played Miranda, also appeared in the final J.B. Harold game Blue Chicago Blues, as well as porn. Lots of porn. However, once again, special mention goes to Bree, played by Kim Little. That name may mean nothing to you, but it means the world to David Michael Latt, as they've been married since 1994, and she's appeared in over two dozen Asylum movies, including a few we've already looked at. When she's not playing the lead in an Asylum production, which she usually is, she's probably somewhere in the film, so think of her as the Asylum's own Where's Waldo. Hey, challenge accepted. There's also an actress named Rachel Latt, who plays Sarah the College Virgin, who only has three movies to her resume. This one, this movie but edgier, and the cult classic nudist colony of the dead. You know, the film that gave us this certain earworm. It's an inky dinky doo da morning, inky dinky doo da morning, morning, morning. I can't find anything that suggests she and the director are related. No, but if they are, hooray for nepotism. The rest of the movie, I unfortunately can't heap as much praise upon. It's a practically no budget movie, and it shows in nearly every technical aspect. The camera, while not the worst we've seen so far, is pretty grainy, even for 1990s standards. And it's done no favors by the home tape quality. Yeah, sorry for the picture looking worse than usual, but as far as I can tell, this was never given a DVD release, so it's VHS or nothing. Give him credit though, it is much more stable and focused than a lot of the other movies we've seen. It's not jittering around, and the sweeps are very smooth with expert tracking, so even if it's like looking through muddy lenses, I can at least make out what's going on. Though minus all points for shots that forgot to take the lens cap off all the way. Also visible boom mic. The scene editing is fine, I don't remember a scene feeling out of place or any major goofs left in, but the sound editing is... odd. I don't know how much crap to give the movie for the buzz and mechanical hum, as that could just be coming from the VHS, but luckily the film has an even bigger goof to talk about. Every new shot, you can clearly hear an obvious change in the sound and white noise, like they move the microphone every time they switch shots. Take this scene. Normally, for audio meant to sound consistent across multiple shots, they'd create a new track and add it in post-production, or at least take the audio from one shot and overlay it across following shots. But here, it sounds like they filmed the same scene multiple times at different angles and spliced the scenes together but kept the audio from each different shot. So this scene that's supposed to switch between two different shots of the same scene sounds like it was recorded from two different microphones. I'm a sinner, and I'll sing it out loud from the deepest dark ocean to the fullest cloud. Half of the movie is like this. Frequent audio glitching as they switch to a new shot, with the actors constantly interrupting themselves. Like a kid with an old camcorder trying to tape over a scene with a retake, not knowing where the previous scene started. Alex! Alex, Alex wait! Give me the benefit of the doubt! Hey, give me a break! You're a better liar! I'm not lying. I'll admit, this is a mistake we haven't come across yet, and I'm fascinated by just how amateur it is. Especially since it's not even a consistent error. The outdoor shots sound just fine, with dialogue clearly dubbed in later to avoid ambient noise, so they knew how to use ADR. It's just for indoor shots, which normally wouldn't need dubbing, they couldn't keep the audio on the same level. Why don't you tell me about shit? Maybe I don't want 
show you about Chet. Now, you please leave? And yet, with how bad the sound is, the soundtrack is really good. Possibly the best we've heard in an Asylum movie. We get a lot of independent rock acts doing both songs and instrumentals for certain scenes in this movie, and they're all cheesy, overproduced power pop rock songs that were all the rage back then. Listen to this track and tell me it doesn't sound like a forgotten Scandal single. That's what most of the music is. Like they tried to recreate the soundtrack to Top Gun. It's not just one band trying to sell an album, like a few of the movies we've seen here. It's a bunch of different bands trying to sell singles. It's like the soundtrack to Scarecrow for the adult contemporary charts. It's corny, it's archaic, it's too good for this movie, and I love every minute of it. And that's a good way to summarize the movie as a whole. It's stock, cliche, dated, and in some aspects embarrassingly amateur. But that's also what makes it so fun to watch. It's a time capsule of the last gasps of the late 80s, early 90s, an era so different anyone under 25 would think this movie was from another planet. It's not good by any means, but I still found myself enjoying quite a bit of it, ironically and unironically. Heck, it's a low-budget adult comedy called Sorority House Party. I'm surprised I got anything out of it. It is one of the best and funniest Asylum movies I've seen so far. Not exactly the highest bar to reach, but I'm sure they take what they can get. If you're interested in a lighthearted comedy with more 90s cheese than an episode of Saved by the Bell, and equally as shameless, check this out and have a good, nostalgic laugh. And for any delicate snowflakes who are shocked and offended that I praise such an anti-PC movie, take it up with my main man, Jim the Indian Indian. Well, it's the beginning of the legend in the B-movie market. David Michael Latt has had a taste of filmmaking, so it's all systems go from here. But what kind of movie would he decide to make next? Would he stick around in the cheesy comedy sector, or would he try something different for his next project? Something darker, edgier, something that would more accurately represent the new direction of movies in the late 90s. Tune in next time to find out. Or just look at this box art. That should give you a clue. Hey there everyone, thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please consider supporting me on Patreon and help me create even more content like this. It's only a dollar to get early access to my videos, and only five dollars gets you a credit at the end of each of those videos, with higher tiers offering these and even more perks. And as you help me reach certain goals, I have super special content lined up for all of you. Head on over and check out my Patreon today, and I'll see you next time.